Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Nickham. I'm the Education Director for the BPC Education Center. And I'd like to welcome you to our last webinar of the season of the year, uh, which is Home for the Holidays. If you have kidney failure, you probably have heard the term home dialysis, but you may not know what this treatment approach entails, or you may not have talked to people who actually do home dialysis. And while we talk about Home for the Holidays, you will have the opportunity to both uh, hear others as well as speak to people who have been there and are on the journey of home dialysis. Um, as a quick reminder, before we start the program, all lines are muted, but you can ask questions and make comments in the chat box. I am now happy to introduce Vanessa Evans, who will be both a, a presenter as well as a facilitator for today's program. Vanessa has been on dialysis for over 23 years and is the Senior Manager of Advocacy and Communities for Fresenius Medical Care. A passionate advocate for the last 14 years, Vanessa does not let her diagnosis slow her down. She holds a master's degree from Emerson College and a BA in Political Science from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. She has presented for many organizations, including NKF, PCORI, ANNA, AAKP, FDA, and HHS. She is considered an expert in patient experiences and engagement. Vanessa is also a board member for our own Dialysis Patient Citizens and the APC Education Center. You will also find an article on travel written by Vanessa in our latest issue of the Kidney Citizen. And at this point, Vanessa, I will turn the program over to you. Wonderful, Kathy. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I am so excited to be here today. Um, I'm here with, with two of my friends uh, that I'm going to introduce in one minute. Um, so as Kathy said, I, I am also a current dialysis patient, have actually been doing dialysis for 22 years. The last 17 years, I've been doing home hemodialysis. So really talking about home and what it means and how to get there is, is part of my passion as not only a patient, but also um, the senior manager of advocacy for Fresenius. I am excited, delighted, happy to have my two friends with me, Dawn Edwards. Dawn, can you introduce yourself for a minute? Tell us where you're from, what you do. Hey, hey, everyone. I'm Dawn Edwards. I'm straight out of New York, New York. Um, I am a fellow kidney warrior. Um, I've been a kidney patient for the past 30 years. Um, I've done in-center hemo, um, PD, and um, I've had a transplant, and now I've been doing home hemodialysis for the past 10 years. I'm also a um, patient advocate for Fresenius Next Stage, and I hold a whole lot of other positions, and um, I'm really excited about being here with my friends Vanessa and Latasha today. Looking forward to a great webinar. Awesome, Don. Thank you. You are one of our elite advocates for sure. Um, not to be dismissed, I have Latasha Thomas with me. Latasha, do you mind introducing yourself? Tell me where you're from, what you're currently, and what is your um, coordination here with dialysis? Good afternoon, everybody. I am calling in and speaking to you from Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, as they call it. I am <laughs> currently a transplanted patient. I celebrated my one-year transplant anniversary on December the 1st. Yay! Um, Yay. But formerly, I have done home dialysis with paraphernal dialysis. Uh, I've been in center for roughly about 45 days while waiting to go home. Um, so that's currently my dialysis journey. Um, I was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And just, you know, what do I do in my personal life or in my business life? I am an uh, active attorney in Nashville, Tennessee. So that's me. That's what I do. And looking forward to hanging out with my friends and talking to you guys about Home for the Holidays. Awesome. I love knowing that if I go to Nashville, I have a legal friend that can help me out of any trouble. 
Um, all right, so before we get started, I do want to say just a couple of notes of being a presenter. We want to make this an interactive conversation. We have a lot of people on the line today. Um, for those of you that are on the line, we do have a chat function. So if you look over to the right, you can go in and you can post um, any question that you may have for this great group of panelists, and we'll be more than happy to ask those questions and make it an interactive um, so that you guys get your answers and questions answered, okay? So with that, let me move on to the next slide here. This is about our agenda. Our, our thought today is that we really were thinking about Home for the Holidays. It's this wonderful new time of the year, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, all this wonderful time to celebrate. And wouldn't it be a great time to go home and do dialysis as well, right? So we went over our introductions just now. Uh, now we will be talking about in order. So what are my home treatment options? So we'll be discussing that in a minute. What are some common myths that we hear about home dialysis? Because we know there are a lot of them. What are the potential benefits for HHD? HHD means home hemodialysis. And what are the potential benefits for PD? That means peritoneal dialysis. And then we'll finish off with some patient resources. And like I said, we want to make this an interactive discussion. So we have set a time for some Q&A. So don't be shy. Put your questions in the chat, and we'll be sure to, to ask them as we move along here. So my first slide um, talks about home dialysis treatment options. And really, when you start doing home dialysis, there are two ways that you're able to do dialysis in your home. One of them is peritoneal dialysis, PD, and I'll discuss that in one minute. And the other one is HHD, home hemodialysis. So there are two options to be able to do dialysis in your home. So let's start with PD, okay? So what's interesting about PD is uh, that you can do this treatment really anywhere. And it actually uses the lining of your own belly. So we know that as your peritoneal membrane. That covers actually the abdomen to filter the blood and toxins and all those extra fluids. So what's nice about PD and why a lot of people pick it is because it doesn't involve blood or needles. You're actually using your peritoneal membrane. And PD is performed daily. And you can do it basically two ways. You can do CAPD, which is a, a manual way to do peritoneal dialysis, or you also could do the PD cycler, where you might be doing it at night while you sleep. Some people actually do a hybrid where they might do a little bit of both. So a little bit of background on that. So I want to bring in my friend, Latasha. Um, Latasha, let's first talk about how you chose PD. Why, why was PD your go-to? What, what kind of attracted you to the PD choice? So that's a great question, Vanessa. Um, when I was first diagnosed, um, I was a traveling maniac, as they say. I was always going somewhere, <laughs> always doing something. And I kind of got a little, you know, I wouldn't say frustrated, but you probably could say frustrated, saying, oh, you mean I'm going to have to go sit in the clinic three, three days a week? That is just not conducive to my lifestyle. So <laughs> the doctor said, well, oh, you can do it at home. Um, and so he sent me to meet a nurse that taught me about the different ways that you could do PD dialysis at home. And um, she didn't have to say much. I was sold because she basically told me that I could pack that thing up in a box and go wherever I wanted to go with it. And I was doing dialysis right. on my own time. So that, that was pretty much what convinced me. Um, and why I was convinced that PD was the best option uh, for me. Um, and so, you know, everyone has their own choices and their own decisions to make. And I always say, you know, talk with your care team because PD is not for everyone. There are some things that you have to have in place that have to be functioning very mm -hmm. well for you to be effective to use PD. But it's an option for you. And my other reason, Vanessa, I'll say real quick and spin it back to you, is <laughs> there's no needles of blood involved. So because of that, <laughs> I definitely was interested, and it was also a treatment that I could do solo um, in my own home. 
Yeah, and that's, that's really very attractive to many people, right, that there is no blood or needles, um, and I totally understand that as why somebody might want to pick, you know, kind of PD to go with that option first. But I think a lot of us agree, like, nobody really likes going to a center, right, three days a week um, and kind of being on the schedule of the clinic. And so being able to do PD is a great choice when to, to kind of make that transition home, particularly for the no blood or needles. And one thing that we don't have on here that we probably also should talk about is PD is also a great choice if you have any residual kidney function. So, Latasha, do you know what residual kidney function is? I'm sure you do. Oh, definitely. And I had residual kidney function. Um, in fact, up until my transplant, I still had residual kidney function. Amazing. Wow. So for those of you that are on the line, residual kidney function means that basically you still have a little bit of kidney function, right? And so with, if you do PD dialysis, um, they say that it actually may extend the life of the kidney that you have um, because PD is known to be kind of maybe a kinder, more gentler treatment. And so it, it can be really useful for somebody that does have that residual kidney function. It might be a great way to starting your career, if you will, with dialysis at home. So thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha, for sharing that little bit. Let's get into home hemodialysis. So this one is known as HHD, all right? So we're talking about the treatment that you do in center, but you're doing it at home. So it's not PD dialysis, right? It's doing the same formula that you're doing when you're in center follows that same treatment and procedure of removing and cleaning your blood that you would be doing at home. Now, what's interesting about home hemodialysis is a lot of people worry like, oh my God, I don't want that, you know, big machine in my house. Well, there are machines now that are suited especially for home. Um, and I would note a couple of things. So the next stage system actually has a machine that you can do nocturnally while you sleep with a care partner. And you can also do solo or independent dialysis. Um, again, this would be during waking hours and you would need your physician's prescription, you know, approval to be able to do that. But similar to PD, you can do it in the comfort of your own home. You can do it day or night, like I just told you. Um, and what we have found is that when patients do more frequent therapy, and I'm actually one of them, so I do my treatment five, six days a week more frequently. And when you do your treatments more frequently, you may actually have clinical benefits. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, but what I can tell you is that when I was doing three days a week of dialysis, and by the way, I was, you know, a pretty compliant patient. Um, I did eat and drink, you know, what I should, and Dawn, I'm going to get to you because I know your story as well. But um, that being said, I was still on blood pressure pills, and I didn't always feel well. And what I found is when I transitioned over to do more frequent therapies, doing five days a week, I immediately felt better. And within three days, I was actually off all my blood pressure pills, um, something that I really didn't think that I would be able to do. And I really attribute that to doing more frequent therapy and being able to do it at home. So, Dawn, I want to bring you into this conversation because I know that the way you started home, actually you started with PD and then ended up transitioning to HHD. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of your journey and how you came to HHD now via PD? Yeah, Vanessa, you know, I'm one of those long haulers. Um, I started my kidney journey when I was 23 years old. And like mm -hmm. you said, I started um, in center. I did three and a half years of that, and it just wasn't working for me. And so I transitioned to peritoneal dialysis, which was a really great option for me at that time because I was young. I had a, a three-year-old at home, and, you know, I had a lot of mommy things to do, and I wanted to travel. And so PD worked really great for me at that time. And then I got my kidney transplant, which lasted six years. And when my transplant rejected, I was no longer able to do PD anymore. And so that's when I discovered home hemodialysis because 
I had already become independent. I was empowered. I was moving around, and I wanted to continue that lifestyle that I had. So being insensitive just wasn't an option for me anymore. And that's when I started my home hemodialysis training, um, and that was 10 years ago. And believe it or not, even when since I started home hemo, things have changed around since then. Um, you're really able to um, adjust your treatments according to your lifestyle. So this has really proven to be a great option for me, not only for because of the outcomes and how great I feel, but because of the, um, the ability that I have to kind of center my, my treatments around my lifestyle and not the other way around. Yeah, I think you're bringing up, you know, a really important point here, John, which, you know, I think a lot of us feel when, when we start in center that you lose your, your own self, right, because you're adhering to a schedule that might not be your schedule, like it didn't allow you to do those mommy things like you were just saying, John. And Natasha, I know you're busy with work and you do your trips with your friends and, you know, it really just doesn't allow you to have that flexibility that you want to have. And I think even more importantly, something that we don't talk about a lot is some of the clinical benefits. When we're doing dialysis, you know, in center, a lot of times we're really just not feeling so well. Um, and exactly. so there is something, right? Yeah. So yeah. there really is something to be said about kind of taking over your chronic illness. I always use that quote, which is, I don't want the chronic illness to control me. I want to be able to control that chronic illness. But if I'm being right. really truthful with you ladies and with our listeners, it took me eight years to get there. You know, I, yeah. I was in center for a good amount of time, eight years, um, before I thought maybe this is something that I could do at home. And the reason that it took me so long is because there were a lot of, maybe challenges and, and barriers and fear that might have been pre, you know, kind of preconceived because of what I saw going on in center and kind of what I heard. I don't know, ladies, do you agree with me there? I agree with you 100%. Um, I was almost uh, frightened to death to go home until I really sat down and took a good look at the equipment and I talked to the nurse and I learned about it. And nowadays, you know, we have patient um, peer mentors and patient advocates in different places you can go that you can get that information and just really clear up a lot of those myths and misconceptions. Yeah. And I would just add to that, Don, that, you know, when I finally decided that I was going to make my, my transition home, um, it was like a year-long transition. It, it wasn't like I woke up one day and I went. But I know that my transition is different than Latasha or, and, and different than Dawn. So, Latasha, I want to bring you in for a minute um, and ask you just about your, your transition over to PD. Was this something that, like, when you heard about it, you're like, that's it, I'm doing it? Or were, were there any fears? What, what did you think when you were kind of making that transition to PD or starting PD? How did that work? So just to be clear for our webinar uh, audience, yep. um, I originally chose PD and to go home um, before I was told that I had to start dialysis. Uh, it so happened I was on a trip, and I thought I had food poisoning, but unfortunately when I got back to the emergency room, they said, girl, we need to clean your blood. You need to start dialysis. <laughs> So I basically started dialysis on a permacast and an emergency start um, from, the, from the hospital. So with that being said, I was waiting for my gallbladder to be removed so that I wouldn't have anything, you know, in that stomach that could cause any infection with that PD catheter. And so while I was waiting on that to heal, that was why I was in center for 45 days. March 1st, wow. 2019, I went home um, where I was originally supposed to, to start. Uh, my myths or my misconceptions that I thought was, and, you know, my family thought this too because nothing in my house requires me to feed it, provide it shelter or anything. It's just me that lives there. <laughs> I love when you and, say that. 
Right. And my my mom and my family were concerned about me pumping all this fluid into my stomach while I was sleeping at night. And, you know, would it leak into my lungs? Would I dry drown? You know, all the things that, you know, people could think would, could go wrong with fluid being pumped in, into your body. Um, and so that was kind of the biggest myth, you know, that I, I kind of had to ask my doctor, so how safe is this? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that once I got over that and to convince my family that, you know, I wasn't going to be laying in my house, you know, having issues from that, I think it was more easy to convince my family that it was okay for me to do this at home by myself because I was really already convinced. Um, and yeah. so at that point, that was kind of one of the misconceptions that, you know, I I had heard out there that I needed to kind of pop it out a little bit with, with my care team. No, and, and that's a great one. So let's let's get into some of those kind of myths and misconceptions, right? Because um, there are a lot of common ones, and I think, you know, you just brought a, a good one up um, with safety, which we can go back to as well. And remember, uh, audience, feel free to put your questions there into the chat. So what, one of the first myths I want to talk about, a lot of people say, I can't do home dialysis by myself. I need a care partner. And I'm going to uh, start a little bit with you, Dawn, for HHG, because this is definitely a common myth when we talk about home hemodialysis, that you need a care partner to be able to do it. And a lot of people are like, oh, I wish I could do it, but I can't because I don't have anybody that can help me. So shed a little light on that. Can you tell us, um, you know, do you do it at home? Do you have a care partner? What does that look like? Yeah, you know, um, that is such a, a huge myth, and I feel so bad for patients that don't want to take that leap into getting their lives back because, you know, because of fear. So, you know, just to put a little cap on that, when I did start home hemodialysis, I, was, I wasn't well, you know, and I was coming back from the transplant. And so my mother did train with me to be my care partner. But mm -hmm. um, a couple of months after, after I started doing those more frequent dialysis treatments, I started to feel so much stronger and I started feeling better. And like you, Vanessa, um, they started taking medications away. And, you know, I, I, after, you know, after a couple of months, I was just like, you know what, you know, I really don't need my mother to come in here and help <laughs> me anymore. So I pretty much gave her a pass and, you know, and fired her. And I started to, you know, do my treatments, you know, set up everything and put and take everything down myself. And when I shared with my care team how much better I was feeling, they pretty much let me go. So now doing um, home hemodialysis by yourself, um, you have to do it during waking hours. You can't do nocturnal um, solo by, uh, you know, with no one at home. But if it's during the daytime and you only have to do like two and a half or three hours or so, you can um, just set your machine up and pop a movie in, and by the time that movie is done, your treatment is done, and you're off and on your own. So... Um, I, I really want to Im implore patients that, you know, that are by themselves, don't be afraid. You know, there's so much safety mechanisms installed into our dialysis machines that help to keep us safe and technology that's been installed. And, yes, you can do it yourself. Awesome. So let's talk about that a little bit. So, so two things I want to say. So first of all, um, you know, the next stage systems are the only machines right now in the United States that are approved for that solo independent dialysis that you would do during waking hours that you were just talking about, Dawn, as well uh -huh. as nocturnal dialysis that you can do at night while you sleep with a care partner. But you just brought up something really important, which was a little bit about that kind of safety and, and security. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about ancillary supplies that you use to, you know, kind of ensure that, that safety and security when doing either a solo independent treatment or nocturnal while you sleep? What ancil and by the way, ancillary is like those extra supplies that you would use. So what are those, Dawn? Yes. Um, Next Stage is really good about providing these ancillary supplies, like Vanessa said, just extra safety mechanisms that are installed on your mach machine just so they can ensure that you have a good, safe treatment. 
Um, for example, they have a holder for your dialyzer that is a lot more secure so that mm -hmm. um, your dialysis, uh, your dialyzer doesn't slip out during treatment if you move or if you twist or turn. Um, there's also a, um, a leak detector that goes underneath your machine, and it's so cute. It doesn't right. um, add. It doesn't add to the size of the machine or it's not anything large or obtrusive or anything. It's just a tray that goes under your dial dialysis machine. And if your dialyzer starts to leak during treatment, um, there's an alarm that goes off so that you know that your dialyzer is leaking. You know, um, there's also uh, something called red scent that you can use to take over your arterial access point um, right over your puncture site so that if any blood or any liquid starts to leak or it detects any fluid, it'll alarm. And I'm telling you, the neighbors next door can hear um, if that <laughs> alarm is going off. Uh, so, you know, yeah. they've, they've been really smart about providing us with um, with things to help to keep us safe so that we can feel secure during those, during those treatments. Yeah, I think that's, that's great, everything that you added. And, and I would also say that, you know, just in general, if you're doing kind of a solo independent um, or nocturnal treatment, you're going to have extra training as well, right? So you're, you're going to learn. Yeah, no one's going to, no one's going to have you go home uh, until you're actually ready. So there'll be, there'll be extra training for sure. Um, I want to talk to you, Latasha, about PD dialysis. I, you talked to us that you, what did you say, you don't care for anyone, nobody is dependent to feed, you don't need to feed them, clothe them, et cetera. So I'm assuming that you did PD dialysis on your own. I am. And, and I did get a plant recently, Vanessa, so I, I do have to water it. <laughs> but I am. I, depend, I depended on doing PD dialysis on my own. I would get home after work in the evenings, you know, have dinner, enjoy my afternoon time. Then, you know, when it came time for bedtime, I would do my procedure to get hooked up. I've got 20 foot of line. That means I can, like, roam around my upstairs area with the 20 foot distance. I'd watch movies, eat popcorn, enjoy myself until I fell asleep all while my treatment was going. Wake up the next morning, disconnect, and I'm, I'm back in the courtroom that next morning by 8 o'clock or back in the office doing what needs to be done um, in, in, for work. So, yes, definitely um, I'm solo. That's awesome. And, again, with PD, there is no blood or needles. So, that, you know, that's something to think about as well. Ladies, we do have a question um, in our chat that I thought I would pose uh, to both of you. And it's a great, actually, it's really a very good question, it's particularly with the crazy weather that we have been having the past, I don't know, two years. And the question is, um, if I am a home dialysis patient and there is a power outage, right, um, what do you do? What do you do? And I think that they're asking, like, um, I'm going to assume that they're asking, like, if you're on the machine and there's a power outage, what do you do? Which, you know, could be a little scary. So I, I've got some answers, but, Don, I'll let you ask first or answer first. I, I love that question because um, before you leave training, the nurse, um, your training nurse goes over um, emergency procedures with you. And we mm -hmm. all know that the weather is crazy. And I live in New York City. We're subject to have a power outage. And, you know, that, that's happened to me on, on occasion while I was doing treatment. And I have and my emergency bag that hangs right on top of my machine. Um, I keep everything in there up to date and everything. And just to give you a simple answer, if the power goes out, I get off the machine. Um, we've been yep. trained how to stop the machine, how to give yourself your blood back, and get off the machine. Yep, that, that is 100% that is true. The only other thing that I would note is one of the things that I feel like I've been starting to do lately is I mean, I'm always watching the weather because I'm looking for sunshine. But um, in general, you know, if I know that it's going to be a, a horrible day tomorrow, right, then I might try to get on the machine, you know, before the bad weather hits. And that's kind of the beauty yeah. of home dialysis yep. 
is that you, you're not on a schedule. So if the weather looks bad at a certain day and time, then you can schedule your treatment right before that and know that you did your treatment the day before. You could then maybe skip that day if it's horrible and then get back on, you know, the next day. And so that is really kind of the beauty of, of doing it at home. And then a couple other things that I would note is that, you know, obviously you should always have near you what Dawn said, which is our, she has her kind of like emergency bag that is near her. You should always have like a flashlight and your telephone um, next to you just in case, um, you know, power goes out, you can't see, something like that. But, of course, I would recommend doing the treatment beforehand. And then I have heard of patients that do have battery backups for their machines, and you'd have to talk to your healthcare team to see what that might be for you, or even a generator, which is a more expensive solution, um, but it is something that certainly can be done. Um, but you should definitely talk to your healthcare team to see what that would be, particularly for you and your and your equipment. Um, I want to, Latasha. I want to ask you the same question. What if you were on PD and you you had a power outage with your cycler? Um, so yeah, so I think the question came from Anna, and yeah, definitely Anna. Yeah. I have been on the PD cycler, and it, the power has gone out in the middle of the night, and the machine has turned off. Um, when you go through the training of learning how to do PD, they teach you a manual process. It's called a manual drain process because you also learn how to do it manually um, in case for some reason the machine stops working on you. Um, and so basically you just switch over to the manual process no matter which uh, process you were in. If you were doing a drain or if you had a field inside, you basically manually drain that fluid with the manual drain bag um, and would continue whatever treatment you have left manually. Um, and so, you know, after that happened to me one night, I will say I did buy a generator, um, but unfortunately <laughs> I haven't, oh, I didn't have to use it. And now since I'm transplanted, I've got a generator just sitting in my garage. But there's definitely processes um, for when the weather is bad. Right. And, and just to kind of reiterate, well, with PD, like Latasha was saying, you have CAPD, with that, which is um, you basically use just an IV pole. So you don't need to be connected to any source of power. And therefore, you can always continue to do your PD exchanges. Instead of doing the cycler at night, you'd probably do PD exchanges. And that was part of your, your training. Some people actually just do manual because that's what they want to do. Um, some people do the cycler at night. Some people do a combination of both. So these are good questions that you can have with your healthcare team. Um, all right, I, there is another question in the chat, and I want to hopefully I'm getting it right, uh, Monica, and if I'm not, please feel free to type it in um, correctly. So this one's for you, Dawn, and, and she says, I eventually might be going back on dialysis. What's the difference between home hemo, I think she means between home hemo solo and nocturnal. So can you just maybe just reiterate that? And Monica, if I didn't get your question right, feel free to correct me in the chat there. I think we want to know, Dawn, what is the difference between doing dialysis nocturnally and home chemo? Oh, sure. Hey, Monica. Uh, good to see you on. And, you know, to answer your question, um, home chemo solo is doing di your dialysis on the home chemo machine during daytime, waking hours. Okay, um, and you may be doing shorter treatment, um, and I say shorter treatment, that all depends on what your prescription is and what you work out with your nurse and your care team. A nocturnal dialysis treatment is when you do your dialysis treatment at night while you sleep. Like PD um, people use their cycler at night while they sleep. A nocturnal dialysis treatment is when you use your home hemo dialysis machine and you do a nice low blood flow, slow dialysis for five hours or more at night while you sleep. And when you do nocturnal dialysis, you do need to have someone at home with you um, while you're doing your treatments nocturnally. I hope that that Perfect. answered your question. I think you did a great job. Awesome. All right, I'm going to move it along, ladies, because we have a couple more myths we want to get through. This is a big one. I can't travel with my home machine, right? A lot of people think that if they're doing dialysis, 
um, whether, you know, in their home it's this big machine and they're not able to travel with it. So I'm wondering, have either of you taken a trip with your dialysis machine? I'll ask Latasha first since, Don, you just spoke. Latasha. So, yes, uh, I started home dialysis in March of 2019. I had a trip planned to Costa Rica with my girlfriends in May. I uh, mm -hmm. spoke with my care team, and I basically told them I didn't get any trip insurance, so I'm going on this trip. We need to be ready. <laughs> uh, we all worked together, and working with my care team, I was able to travel uh, with my dialysis, my home dialysis, to Costa Rica. Uh, I got the equipment on the plane, um, you know, for those of you who are worried about that. It flies free, so don't be alarmed about the cost. And I um, pretty much got to Costa Rica, went through customs, had my letter from my doctor uh, translated to uh, Spanish so that, you know, just in case there were any issues going through Costa, Costa Rican customs, got in the country, enjoyed my trip, went zip lining with my friends, had an amazing time, and then came back. Um, the one caveat I will, would give for that, if you are traveling internationally, um, and doing your dialysis where you're not within the United States to get the tech support and things like that that you need, definitely speak with your care team, um, you know, so that they know what you're, that you have an emergency plan in place. I, my emergency plan was always to have a little extra cash just in case I needed to fly back home um, in case of an emergency or things of that nature. So, you know, definitely speak with your care team, but it's something you surely can do. Um, and something that you definitely can do with just a little more planning. That's awesome. So I, I do have a question for you with this, um, Latasha, with PD. How do you actually get the PD machine on the plane? Like, did you pack it in your suitcase, or how do you how do you pack it? That's an awesome question too. So there <laughs> is this lovely Samsonite hard case suitcase. It's probably not Samsonite by brand. I hope I'm not advertising for them on this webinar. Um, but it's a hard case suitcase. Uh, you place the PD machine in that hard case suitcase. You mark it. Definitely you want to mark it as fragile, and you definitely want to let the airline know when you get to the airline that it is emergency life-saving equipment. I tell them it's my dialysis machine, and it's got to get to my destination. Um, and then, and I, I only do that pretty much to make sure that they know I don't need you throwing this around under the plane, although they'll probably do it anyway. But I try to I was avoid say, that. say there's no guarantee and, of that. <laughs> <laughs> there's no guarantee. Um, and then, you know, um, that's pretty much how I get on the plane. Any solution that I take into the airport, remember I'm solo when I do this. So if you've ever seen a girl in your local airport with this rolling um, cart that has, like, all of these boxes and supplies on them, it's probably me. Um, I, I have a cart that I rolled into the airport that I actually fold it up and I actually put it under the plane as a piece of my medical equipment so that when I do get to my destination, I can offload all that stuff on the conveyor belt and put it, you know, put it with me. They do give you the option of taking the machine onto the plane with you, uh, but oftentimes for me with international flights, I'm connecting in different airports and I don't really want to be lugging a 58-pound suitcase while I'm trying to run to get to the next uh, flight. So I've always checked it under the plane, um, but they do have the option that you can take it onto the plane with you. Um, once again, I always give the caveat that, you know, you're, you're responsible when you take it out of the country because of the technical issues. You're not going to be able to call tech support and get that 24-hour care that you can when you're in the United States. So always have a backup plan. Now, for when you're traveling, yeah, I United think States, that, that's key. It's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I just want to clarify one thing. So Latasha is talking about um, her PD machine. Um, with an HHD machine, there is a travel case as well, but you cannot bring that onto the cabin. It, it, it is a bigger machine, and so it is a bit of a different protocol. You can, you're going to check it in like regular luggage. So actually, Don, let's go to you. Um, have you taken the, the HHD machine on a trip? And if so, how do you do that? Oh, I sure did. I just got back last Monday from a trip, actually. And if you look at your screen, you see a picture of me up there at the top in South Florida. I took my machine there with me as well. 
but um, the awesome. procedure is, you know, just really being organized. Um, I took um, my machine with me to Hawaii uh, um, two weeks ago. I had a wonderful time. I, I packed my machine. I had my son-in-law help me because the HHD machine does weigh 70 pounds, and there is a hard carrying case which is FAA approved that your machine goes in to keep it safe during the flight. Um, you check it in as luggage, like Vanessa said, you put your luggage tags on there, fragile tags, a heavy tag on there, because by the time you get it in the case, it's 100 pounds. Um, I make sure that I have um, extra money for tips, because I'm not picking that machine up. But um, <laughs> I make sure that I have tips so that I can get help. And when that machine leaves, um, leaves my side at the airport and it gets checked in, I don't see it anymore until I get to my destination and I tip someone to put it in the cab for me to take me to the hotel or wherever I'm going. So, yes, you absolutely can travel. I travel with it, and I'm going to be traveling in another two weeks. I'm going to South Florida for vacation. So, Yes, take your machine and travel and live your best life. Just have to. You're living the good life. <laughs> Absolutely. You, re you really are. I love it. Um, I think that, you know, you, you said a couple of things. So, number one, with any kind of travel, you always want to inform your healthcare team. Um, you know, they're going to help you set up that travel and whatever you need. Latasha did a great job about talking about a backup plan. You know, things happen. We live in this crazy world. You do want to make sure that you have a backup plan. And the other thing that I want to make sure that I mention is that the Department of Transportation, otherwise known as the DOT, they actually have guidelines for traveling with a, a portable, what they call assistive device, which is, you know, these dialysis machines. And so, you know, you, you can get a copy of that. Um, if you look online, there, there's a copy of that. And one thing that I always do is I call the airline. And I let them know I'm, I'm going to be checking in, you know, next week or whenever it is, and I'm bringing my dialysis machine. And the one thing, the most important thing out of all of this is give yourself time. Give yourself time. You know, uh, allow sure. yourself, yeah, you know, like, you know, know that you're going to need a little a, a, a bit of time when you do these things. And that way you're just not stressed about it. You're kind of taking the time to go through it, right? Yes, definitely. Anything else I'm missing, ladies? No, I think you pretty much hit it with the travel. Yeah. Awesome. Got it. All right. Let's, I got it. All right. Let's move to our last myth here. Um, it looks like we're doing good on timing, which is great. So this is, this is like a really relevant one. I hear this one all the time. I can't do home dialysis um, in my small living space, or I can't move it around in my home. So let, let's just kind of pick off the first one first. You can't do it because you, you live in a space that you just can't put all the supplies. And I want you guys to note these two pictures. So that's actually a picture of me over to the right there. And that is my average supplies of one month of home hemodialysis. Obviously, it's going to vary from person to person. And, you know, let's make note, I'm not that tall. I'm about 5'1". Um, and it's going to be very different for each person. But you can see that that's pretty manageable. And if you look over to the left, that's about an average one month of PD supplies. So truth be told, there are more supplies for PD than HHT. But, you know, there are pros and cons for each kind of modality that you do. So you really, I wouldn't base the supplies on why you would do one modality over another. It should really be about your own individual needs and your clinical needs. So, Dawn, you are a perfect example um, uh, of living in New York City and, and not having, you know, maybe a mansion there. Talk to us a little bit about living in a small space. What is that like, and how do you make it work? Yeah, I mean, there, there can be nothing smaller than New York City real estate. Um, I live in a tiny house in Queens, and my room is like the size of a nursery. Um, some people's closets are probably bigger than my bedroom. But what I did was um, I moved my nightstand out, and I pushed my dialysis machine right in there, and it fits perfectly. 
Um, and I get about the same amount of supplies as Vanessa. So my supplies are right out in the hallway outside of my bedroom. And, you know, just to be completely honest, you know, I, the way that I feel and my outcomes and my quality of life is so much more improved that I would take those boxes and lay my mattress on top of them if I had to, just so that I could continue to do my treatments at home. I feel so much better. So, you know, I know we get caught up with, you know, the aesthetics and how my house is going to look and everything, but, you know, what's really more important is your quality of life and how you feel. But, yep, you can make it work in a small space, believe me. Mm -hmm. Okay, Latasha, um, what about you with the PD supplies? I know that um, you live alone except for you and your plant there now. Um, you, you are transplanted, but was that a concern for you? And, you know, kind of how did you get over the concern in terms of maybe the, the quantity of supplies? Kind of like Don, I would have done anything, mm -hmm. Don, to be able to stay at home. <laughs> so the boxes mm -hmm. didn't scare me at all. But as mm -hmm. you see in the picture, there, those boxes that are there, there are different um, strengths of fluid. So the strength of the fluid is based on the color of the boxes. Just because I know in the picture you see green, you see yellow, there's also red down at the bottom. And so that's the reason, another reason why you have so many supplies, because depending on what type of, you know, what, how much fluid you need to pull off, you're, you may change the strength that you use for that evening versus just using one box. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear out there so you guys wouldn't think, oh, that's a lot of stuff for one day. No, for one month. No. Right. It's a, it's a no, combination. That's, that's really important. That's important. Um, and, and I see that Anna has a question. I'm going to get to your question, Anna. But before I do that, I want to make sure that I kind of get through a little bit of the benefits, and then we'll, we'll come to Anna's question for sure. So potential benefits for more frequent therapy for both HHD, remember that's the home hemodialysis and PD, is you can have an improved, you know, five-year survival. That's kind of a big deal. Um, a greater quality of life, as we've both been talking about, the schedule with the flexibility. You might be able to go back to work and attend school and just live your life, you know. That's great. Ability to travel, the, you know, both Latasha and Don do. And by the way, I didn't even talk about me. I travel, well, I used to travel all the time. I will say that COVID has kind of slowed it down. But I think within the last five years, I did about 30 trips. So, you know, you, you really can travel. Um, and, and the biggest piece I think that we all love is that there's increased control. We really feel like we are now controlling our chronic illness and it's not controlling us. So that, that's important to note. Why home dialysis? You know, both PD and HHD allow for a lot of clinical benefits that we've talked about. Um, when I'm talking about PD, you know, we, we, we said that it's, you know, easy to learn. There's no blood nor needles. You have options that you can use a cycler at night or do those CAPD exchanges during the day. Or you could do a hybrid and, and do both. It depends on what your, your care team prescribes. What's a real benefit to PD is that it is a small portable machine that does make it pretty easy for travel. You have less diet restrictions, and you may be healthier to receive a transplant like my friend Latasha. Right, Latasha? Oh, you're right about that. I'm loving it. I leave for Jamaica on the 23rd, and I'll be gone two weeks with no equipment. Woo-hoo. Oh, God. Thank you two me. ladies, I'm telling you. Do you remember there's a pandemic? There's a lot going on here. You're living. I love it. Gotta live. Yeah. No. Um, and <laughs> for HHD, um, same, benefits, you know, um, train on their learning speed. And, and actually, let me just take this quick minute to talk about that. You know, everybody trains a little differently. Um, some patients on HHD, you know, if you know cannulation, meaning you know how to put in the needles, might only take you 10 days to train. Uh, if you don't know cannulation, putting in the needles, it might be a little longer where PD might be about one week or two weeks. So real quick, Latasha, how long did it take you to train on PD? Um, so it took me roughly about four, four days um, because four days. I had to learn the manual procedure first, um, so CAPD first, and then I ended up learning how to use the cycler on day two and day three, learning any troubleshooting. Um, day four, I was ready, but I had to wait for my machine to come in and the nurse to come to my house to set it up. 
but pretty about four days. But I will say that if you're a slower learner or you want more time or you don't feel comfortable, that nurse will stay there with you and train you until you feel comfortable to go home. So if they say a week or two weeks, if you don't feel comfortable after that initial training, speak to your care team. They'll provide you more training because they want you to be comfortable once you once you leave to go home by yourself. Yeah, that's good a great point, point. Tasha. Yeah, mm -hmm. really good point. And John, I know HHG is obviously longer. You're dealing with blood and needles. So how long did it take you? I think it took me, um, it was my mother and I. My mother was 65 mm -hmm. at the time. So we took a little bit longer. We took about three to four weeks to train. But um, yep. like just That's like Tasha right. said, the nurse took her time and made sure that my mother was able to perform the, you know, all of the safety requirements, and she learned she learned how to do everything. And they they took their time with her, and we were confident when we got home. And then we still got a little bit of help once we got home. Yep. No, that's true. And again, it, it, you, you have your nurse, Sarah, Tasha, you did a great job of really defining that, you know, no one's going to kick you out. You, you, you take the time that you need to train. Um, so that, those are definitely a benefit for both. And just kind of continuing down the line of those home hemodialysis benefits, you know, the, the other piece is that um, with next stage, you do have an option of a small portable machine. So you are able to take it with you when you travel, and you actually could move it in your house. So if you wanted to dialyze in your living room one night, and then the next night you want to dialyze in the bedroom, you would be able to move it. And we discussed how many clinical benefits are reported when you're doing more frequent therapy five days a week. Um, and I think we also talked about, you know, the different kinds of therapy that you can do, the solo, which we talked about doing it, you know, during waking hours. And then nocturnal, you would do it at night while you sleep with a care partner. And then some people just do more frequent therapy, which is what I actually do. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. So let's move on to talk a little bit about patient resources. Because I, you know, this is awesome. I love, thank you so much, you know, Anna, Monica, and anyone else that feels like they want to ask us a question, please be sure to put it here in the chat. We've got maybe less than 10 minutes left here. But there is another resource that I want you guys to know about. So DPC, uh, Dialysis Patient Citizens, they actually hold a monthly telephone support group. And that's actually the second Tuesday of every month at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And if you want more information, you can go to the DPC website to do that and learn what the number is and for the call-in. I have to say that I know a couple of people that were on the call actually this past Tuesday. And honestly, I, I heard it was really amazing. There was a lot of raw emotion on the call and a lot of people kind of learning and, and talking and answering one another. And, you know, there's no agenda. You can kind of just go on there and ask your questions. Um, and there, there are a lot of very experienced patients on there can, that can really walk you through all questions when it comes to dialysis, as well as the DPC staff and the Education Center. Kathy and Hannah do a phenomenal job. So a little shout out to them for getting on that call on that second Tuesday of the month. Of course, you could always talk to your healthcare team. They're a wonderful resource. You know, they, they can tell you a lot of information. And I want to give a shout out to um, the patient consultant team at NextStage. So what's really cool about this team is they are also either current dialysis patients or former dialysis patients that are doing home dialysis. And so there is nothing better than having kind of that peer-to-peer -peer conversation and so if you call this 1888 number, 200-6456, you know, they're going to answer the call. One of them are going to answer the call or they're going to give you a call back. And you're going to be contacted directly to a home patient or a loved one of a home patient. And any other questions that you might have, particularly to home and getting you home for the holidays, they're going to be able to answer. So don't be shy. Go ahead and, you know, they, they want to answer your questions. That's literally what they're there for. And it's so important to know that you actually have these resources. And then the last piece is there are a lot of communities on Facebook. There are a lot of dialysis communities on Facebook, whether you're a home patient or you're an in-center patient. So I invite you to kind of explore Facebook and 
type in in your search what you're looking for, and I'm sure that you will come up um, with any groups that could help you. So that's a little bit about our resources. And we have about five minutes left here to get to Anna's question and any others that come up. Anna asked a really good question that's here in the chat, which is, um, you know, talk about the water used for treatment if traveling outside the country. My church is going to the Holy Land next year. Is the local water used for treatment? And I think we need to clarify a little bit here. So, Anna, if you're doing a home dialysis treatment and, and you're traveling, if you're doing home dialysis, um, hemodialysis, so like a next stage system, a home hemodialysis, there are bags that are, um, that are hanging bags, that are sterile hanging bags that you would travel with. And you would use those hanging bags, those pre-mixed sterile hanging bags, and you would use that for the next stage machine. So you would not use the local water because you're gonna use those pre-mixed bags. And depending on what your prescription is, is how many bags you would actually hang. And so this is something that you would work with your healthcare team, but for home hemo, the answer to your question is no, you would not be using the local water source. And Latasha, I'm gonna let you answer that for PD because I believe it's the same, but I'll let you take that answer. So for PD, all of your fluid is in a mm -hmm. sterilized bag um, just as well. Uh, the only water that you'd be using is to wash your hands, um, you know, for to do the sterile treatment of putting on the, um, the PD catheter connecting to the machine. Um, so that's the only time I can think of that you would actually use water. Uh, per se, so you know that's kind of the water you wash your hands with, and not any water for your treatment. Awesome, and and again, that, that would be the same. Really great good question. Really, yeah. agreed on that. That was a great question. And so, Anna, the answer for both PD and HHD is no. You would not be using the local water. You would be using pre-mixed sterile bags for either hemodialysis with a next stage machine or with a PD machine. They're both use a premixed sterile solution. I really like that question. I'm gonna definitely take that um, for other other webinars and things that we do because that, that's a good one and it hasn't come up a lot, but it's actually a very relevant question when you're when you're traveling. So um, I really I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I really appreciate the interactive discussion that we were able to have and asking and answering these questions. I want to take a minute to thank Latasha and, and Dawn for being on this webinar and to Kathy and Hannah for kind of putting it together and facilitating it. Um, one last thing, um, yes, of course, we want to wish you a happy new year. And before we sign off, I'm going to ask one more question to both Dawn and Latasha. If there is one piece of advice that you could give to the patients that are on the line that might be thinking about a home therapy, what might that be? And uh, Dawn, I'll start with you. Uh, my, my thing is, you know, if you're thinking about it, find out more about it. Don't be afraid. Just learn about it so that you can have control over it and go ahead and jump. And I think that segues it to me, Don. Um, my advice that all I always give patients is I encourage you to know that home dialysis keeps your lifestyle as close to normal as possible. It just takes a little extra effort. So don't be afraid to jump in. Give it a shot. And um, hopefully you'll get a awesome. chance to do some things and continue to do. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. I got I got disconnected for a second there, so hopefully you didn't notice. But I appreciate that. And, and really what we're saying here is that, you know, just take your time. Do your research. Use the resources that we just talked about. Reach out to a consultant. Get on the, the call with the, the support group that DPC has. And just, you know, ask and, and feel free to, to answer, you know. And that's how being an informed patient is being a great patient. And, and that, that's the best thing, that the gift that you can give yourself to the new year is to be informed about all your options. So with that, 
Thank you all so much, ladies. I appreciate the time today. Listen, uh, Latasha, have a wonderful, wonderful time on your next trip. We'll be thinking of you. And Dawn, welcome back, and Happy New Year to everybody. Thanks again. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy, happy, happy holidays. holidays. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa Bye -bye. and Latasha and Dawn. Uh, we certainly appreciate your getting on this call today and all the information you shared. There's very much uh, for us to take in. And the recording of this session, if you want to go back and review it again or share it with others, will be available in the next uh, week or two. And as just a quick reminder, please, when you sign off, please uh, complete the short feedback form. That is very important to us and gives us more information as we start planning some of the things for next year. Um, I also want to reiterate, have a great holiday season. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you for spending the hour with us. And we hope to see you um, next month, last uh, Thursday in January, we will start up our webinars again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Happy, healthy.